Ocean Bites Out Loud, paper featured by Kirsten F. Thompson and others, titled Seabed Mining and Approaches to Governance of the Deep Seabed, published in Frontiers in Marine Science in 2018. A new frontier is opening up and it is not space. It is a place much less explored and closer to home, the deep sea. While we have a lot to discover about the deep sea, we do know that in the depths of the ocean, there are a number of valuable minerals and metals like gold, manganese, and cobalt. Yet with so little known, companies are ready to dive into the cold deep, gathering these metals for economic gain. With a few companies having already acquired contracts for deep sea mining, Researchers and environmentalists are urging caution and asking for time to redefine their understanding of the potential impacts of mining. Dr. Kirsten Thompson and her colleagues remind us that this is a nuanced and complicated problem in their new paper reviewing the intricacies of seabed mining. Why mine? The metals and materials found in the deep sea are incredibly rare, perhaps justifying the level of difficulty and investment required in mining them. These materials are frequently used in technology like smartphones and computers, but also in green energy technology, such as solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles. As countries continue to develop and populations grow, there is an ever-increasing demand for technology. We need green energy more than ever, and extreme weather events serve as reminders of the impacts of climate change. But we know essentially nothing about the potential environmental and societal risks that come with deep sea mining. Will it harm fragile deep sea ecosystems? Could it harm nearby fisheries that people rely on for food? Could mining impact the amount of carbon that oceans absorb from the atmosphere, counteracting improvements to green energy? Essentially, is the amount of materials gained from mining worth the risk? Why should we care about the deep sea? The deep sea is almost entirely unknown, with only about 5% of it having been explored with remote vehicles and less than 0.0001% of it having been sampled. This is largely due to how difficult it is to navigate the region. As Bill Nye puts it, this is due to the three seas. The deep is cold, corrosive, and crushing. This makes exploration expensive, but what little we do know is astounding. The deep sea is where we have found hydrothermal vents, animals that live off of energy from methane instead of the sun, and places where two worms and crabs live in water that shimmers with heat. With some research, who knows what secrets we could discover? The cure for cancer? The next clean energy? A toddler's next animal obsession? But we don't know how mining could impact deep sea ecosystems or even others. For example, global fisheries are an important source of income and food. Mining could stir up sediment from bottom of the ocean, which could drift in and out of country boundaries, changing shallower ecosystems. Could this impact fisheries? The little we know about deep sea ecosystem emphasizes how risky this is to them. Animals in the deep sea tend to live a long time, grow slowly, reproduce slowly, and reach sexual maturity later in life. All of these characteristics make it difficult for these species to recover from disturbances, much less adapt to change. Who gets to make the decisions? Maybe one of the most concerning elements of the approach of deep sea mining is the legal ambiguity. Rights to the seafloor are generally controlled by two groups, countries, which have control over the continental shelves off their coasts, and the International Seabed Authority, or the ISA, which controls international waters. ISA uses guidelines outlined by the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea to make decisions. In this case, they follow Article 140, which states that mining can be done for the benefit of mankind as a whole. But this is the ultimate question. If benefit is interpreted economically alone, then who benefits? The companies mining would certainly benefit, local governments selling the rights to their resources might benefit, but some people may only see the benefit in job opportunities, and still others might see no benefit at all. How do you measure benefit to mankind as a whole? What can we do? At this point, we know almost nothing concretely. There has never been a commercial scale mining trial, so everything at this point is mostly conjecture. With this in mind, the authors recommend five main approaches to help mitigate the possible harm of deep sea mining. First, improve sustainability. By improving how we recycle technology, making products last longer, enhancing designs, 
and being careful with how we use technology, we could make a more circular economy that would decrease our need for these minerals. This would take effort and lifestyle changes. Second, set up a monitoring network that is independent of those financially invested in mining that will collect data and establish procedures for mining deep sea ecosystems while causing the least damage. Third, set up a series of marine protected areas that could give organisms places to recover and live undisturbed. Fourth, be transparent and tell people what is happening in their community so that they have a say, especially indigenous groups and small island nations who are likely to be greatly impacted by these decisions. Lastly, ensure that there is an independent governing body, such as the ISA, that can stop mining should it prove to be damaging. Without these steps, we risk rushing into a situation that we don't understand, one where the economic, social, and environmental consequences could be with us for many years. We have seen the consequences of seeking treasures in the depths of the sea, like the horrific aftermath of the Gulf oil spill. Even barring a meltdown like that of the oil spill, we could still cause irreparable damage to an ecosystem whose worth we haven't even begun to understand, and we could harm fisheries and livelihoods in the process. With so much at stake, is deep sea mining worth the economic benefit? This post was written by Kristen Hazenga on January 7, 2019. It was read here by Anne M. Hartwell. Thanks for listening.